my pleasure to invite uh, Jimmy here. And I want to say two things. One, he gave us a uh, Wikipedia, which I think is a, is a good thing. Um, but I think even more importantly, he gave us uh, an example to something that is extremely unique in the modern society, a uh, collection of people. And I had the pleasure of meeting many of them, about 600 or 700 people in Haifa uh, last couple of days, who are creating uh, something together in a completely new way. And I think the value of the second invention is yet to be fully understand. <coughs> and I'm sure you will give us some insights about that. Thank you, Jimmy. OK, thank you. Uh, great, yeah, so before I started, I wanted to uh, respond or just uh, comment a little bit on uh, what, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Professor Nehan. Karine is fine. Karine. <laughs> uh, what Karine has said, uh, because I think it, it, the, it's really, there's something really interesting going on uh, with that. So when we think about this kind of power law uh, situation, one of the things that can generate this um, would be network externality. So the, the idea here is, one of the reasons that I'm on Facebook instead of a competitor is that all of my friends are on Facebook. And so for me to say, oh, wow, I found this new social network site and I like the software much better and the, it's a cleaner layout and they don't have as many stupid games or whatever it is that I like about it, it doesn't really do me much good. I can't switch very easily because of the network. Uh, but what's interesting, and, and actually there's a the few cl classic examples of this. So one would be... Um, uh, eBay, you know, this kind of example where the buyers go where the sellers are and the sellers go where the buyers are. So markets tend to be concentrated. Another one that's uh, probably not as recognized or it's a little bit harder to get our minds around is in fact Wikipedia because these volunteer community, one of the things that they really value is that they're doing something useful for the world. And that value only comes if they have readers. Um, and so the readers go where the writers are because the large concentration of really thoughtful, smart people have come together to write, but also the writers go where the readers are. So if someone wants to launch a competitor to Wikipedia, they can have really wonderful software, they can try to attract writers, but it's really hard because one of the things writers want is an audience, and so uh, there's that. But what's interesting uh, for me about some of the examples that are listed is that there is no obvious network externality. And um, this is, these are the ones that I find surprising. I think lo lots of things didn't surprise me uh, because I had this idea. Um, I'm not the originator of anything, but you know, I knew about the idea of network externalities. But for a search engine, for example, um, when I switch to Bing uh, and start using Bing instead of using Google, it, it doesn't affect anybody around me. It does, you know, I can use Bing and you can use Google and it doesn't matter. And yet we still see, since uh, 2002, this incredible ramp up in Google's um, market shares, which is quite comparable. Uh, so I, I would have said some time ago, um, and did say, and still say, although I don't believe it anymore um, as much, uh, that, that Google doesn't have, uh, in a certain sense, a defensible business in the same way that Facebook does. Because someone with enough money, who has enough money, maybe Microsoft with Bing, uh, uh, can start a search engine and people can switch or not as they see fit and, and you would naturally expect to see just as you see different television networks and uh, different TV shows and movies and people can watch this one or that one and it's fine. But we don't necessarily see that and I think one of the reasons may just be uh, sort of a, a, an even uh, sort of less uh, sexy and modern uh, economic concept which is just sheer economy of scale. Um, and so the real question is can Microsoft spend enough money to build a search engine as good as Google's? Um, and that's not obvious yet. Uh, certainly we know that AOL can't, we know that Yahoo can't, we know that I can't uh, because it just would, it's just too big of a project. It's too much investment. Um, and again, uh, you know, the, you, you, have to, you have to do all that spending in advance to make the product good enough while you still don't have an audience and you've got to sustain it through all those losing years when you have 3%, 5%, 8%, while Google's making fat, fat, fat money on the advertising on, on the other end. So I, it's not clear to me um, whether the search engine market will, in fact, end up being um, some, somewhat naturally monopolistic in that sense. I don't, I don't know the answer yet, but it's a, it's a really interesting question. So uh, that was just some thoughts that I had that I thought were maybe useful to someone. Um, the, uh, so for Wikipedia, so when we think about tipping points, one of the questions, I just, 
uh, people are always saying, well, what was the tipping point for Wikipedia? And the truth is there was no tipping point. There's nothing I can point to and say, there we had enough critical mass to make it happen. Um, it was either the first day was the tipping point or some other things. I mean, I can point to certain cases where we had a flurry of publicity and our traffic increased. Uh, but in terms of a true tipping point in the way that we think about tipping points where, you know, we, we just barely tipped over just far enough and it just went started to go, I don't think there ever was one. And so I think um, what's important, and, and this is sort of to tie my two points together that I've talked about so far, is a lot of these ideas like network externalities or tipping point are very sexy, very interesting, and they're very cool when you understand how they work. But uh, we have to be really careful that sometimes it's not the right concept to use. Uh, sometimes um, maybe we don't need a tipping point and in the classical true sense for Israel's internet uh, industry. We just need to grow it. We need to sort of support it and, and find the ways to do that. So to talk about that for a little bit, um, I travel all over the world. I meet a lot with young entrepreneurs and government people and so on. Uh, and I, I saw something uh, recently um, that uh, I was in a small Caribbean country that is very excited about trying to build up their internet industry. Um, and I felt like, uh, and, and they showed me two different projects uh, while I was there. Um, one of them I thought was a, a, a sort of a, a marvelous example of uh, what is called a cargo cult mentality. Do people know that expression, cargo cult? So that the concept of a cargo cult is, um, and I'll just tell the story very loosely because I only know the term, not exactly the history of it, but the idea is um, during World War II, uh, in sort of very remote islands in the South Pacific, the Americans suddenly showed up and built uh, runways and flew planes in and uh, because they were there to start fighting the Japanese. and they brought lots of gifts. They brought loads and loads of food and everything for the people on the island because they just they, they weren't there to fight those people. They just wanted them happy so they could fight the Japanese. And so then at the end of the war, they all left. And uh, so on some of these islands, allegedly it may be somewhat apocryphal story, um, they would go out and build um, airstrips um, uh, with coconuts and you know sort of uh, level off ground because they thought the airstrips came and then the gods came and gave us goods. And so the cargo cult mentality is you don't really understand what causes something to succeed, so you build something that sort of looks like it. So the one project I went to was this really, um, it, it looked exactly like a Silicon Valley office park. Um, and it had an incubator, and they would put a university there. And so they sort of had some of the pieces, right? Um, but sort of, and it was all empty. The whole place was completely empty. Uh, because what they, what they, it was as if they had gone to Silicon Valley and said, aha, we see here's an internet industry. What you need is a, a university and you need a big building there and you have a room that's called an incubator and uh, little cubicles. And, uh, but in fact, there's a lot more. There's a lot of moving parts to create uh, an internet industry uh, and there's no single magic bullet and certainly it isn't um, a govern government built office park, doesn't really do it. The other project that they had uh, that they showed me was uh, that the, the first lady has this project of putting computer labs uh, in, in community centers in the poorest parts of uh, the country. And so uh, I've visited now, I've been there twice, I've visited two different ones of them. And what you see in there are young kids in slum neighborhoods, um, you know, with tin roof shacks and so on, but they've got a nice building and they've got the internet. And those kids are sitting there and they're on YouTube and they're on Facebook and they're on Wikipedia and they're IMing with their friends. And so then, you know, later I had a meeting and they said, well, what do you think about the internet industry? What do you think is the most interesting thing? I said, the most interesting thing that makes me optimistic about the future of the internet industry is that you've got all these poor slum kids getting on the internet and just doing stuff because that's where your innovation is going to come from, not from building a, uh, something that looks like a Silicon Valley office building. So, of course, to get the internet right, uh, or to get innovation right, to get small business right, there's a lot of pieces that are sort of the obvious classic things. Tax law has to be right so that there's uh, room for investment. Uh, immigration and visa situation needs to be good, particularly in the internet industry where it is so global and you really need talent to be able to move somewhere. I think this is one of the biggest risks that the U.S. has is uh, if we decide 
uh, in a fit of stupidity that we don't want to have any more Indians coming and taking away American software India, uh, industry jobs. Um, we're just going to, that's fine. They'll go back to India. Guess what they'll do? They'll build internet companies in India. Um, they don't really, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a foolish thing. So immigration visa stuff, right? You need venture capitalists. You need angel investors. Uh, you know, you need all that. But I think the single thing that is really important and really hard to get right is culture. Um, and here I mean a culture that supports innovation, a culture that supports risk taking. Um, the way I always put it in, uh, uh, you know, is that the, you know, if you have a young entrepreneur, um, you need to make sure in your culture that it's accepted and, and okay that, that, the, that the mother uh, doesn't mind, you know. I, I've met, uh, you know, in Korea, I met a young internet entrepreneur who said, you know, I'm just, you know, my mother-in-law. Actually, he was complaining about his mother-in-law. He's like, uh, my mother-in-law can't believe I, I didn't get a real job at a big company. Um, and he's under a lot of family pressure. Like, like, it's just regarded as a completely crazy thing to do to start a company. Um, and in part, because if the company fails, it's considered a real black mark on your record. Whereas, of course, in Silicon Valley, quite famously, um, everybody knows most startups fail. Um, if, you, if you do a startup and it fails, it doesn't mean, well, you're out of the industry, you have to go back home to Kansas, it means you get a good job at Google. Um, so it's fine, you know. So, uh, and I think Israel has that piece right. I think Israel actually, that's one of the great strengths here, is that there is a culture of entrepreneurship, there is an understanding of risk taking. Um, you know, it's a pretty risky place to live. So I think that's kind of naturally uh, really in, in the culture here. So, well, those are some of my 